Welcome to Act 5 of Hamlet. Act 4 ended with the report of the death of Ophelia. Um, Act 5 opens with her funeral, although we don't immediately um, know that that's what it is. In fact, what it opens up with are two grave diggers coming out and digging a grave. Um, this is some more gallows humor. It lightens things up for a little while, if you can call jokes about skulls and death light. And it also is another place where um, the physical structure of the globe is very helpful because they can simply open up the large double trap door, what was called the grave trap. Um, we saw it come into play with the ghost at the beginning of this play, and at the end of this play, um, we get to see it being used as a grave. And so these two grave diggers, um, they're listed as clowns in your text. Clown doesn't mean clown like um, Ringling Brothers kind of clown. Clown just means a rustic kind of person, a simple sort of person. And yet, on the other hand, these guys are making a lot of jokes. <clears throat> And one of the main things they want to know is, why is it that this woman is getting buried when she's an apparent suicide? Um, that doesn't seem right. Suicides were not given full burials. Um, they, in fact, until very late into the 19th century in England, were buried at crossroads, sometimes with a stake in their heart. And that sounds very cruel and scary. Um, but the theory was that suicides were most likely to come back as ghosts. And that if you buried them at the crossroads, they'd get confused and wouldn't know their way back. So, and the the stake in their heart was to uh, nail them down. Those of you who are familiar with Dracula will see the resemblance in that right away. <clears throat> and so they start to argue about whether or not this was a suicide and if it counts. Is she to be buried in Christian burial when she willfully seeks her own salvation? I tell you she is, therefore make her grave straight. The crowner hath sat on her and finds it Christian burial. How can that be unless she drowned herself in her own defense? Well, to sound found so. It must be say offendendo, which means it must have been um, that she killed herself. It cannot be else. For here lies the point. If I drown myself wittingly, it argues an act, and an act hath three branches, to act, to do, and to perform. That's wrong, of course. Argle, she drowned herself willingly. Nay, but hear you, Goodman Delbert, give me leave. Here lies the water. Good. There stands the man. Good. If the man go to this water and drown himself, it is willy-nilly, mar he goes. Mark you that. But if the water come to him and drown him, if he drowns not himself, Argyll, he that is not guilty of his own death, shortens not his own life. Is this law? Mary, is it? Crowner's Quest law. Will you have the truth of it? If this had not been a gentlewoman, she had not. She should have been buried out of Christian burial. Why, there thou sayest, and the more pity that great folk should have countenance in this world to drown or hang themselves more than they're even Christian. Life's just so unfair. If you've got connections, you can even kill yourself without any consequences. All right. And then we start to get up into a bunch of jokes. Um, things like Adam. You know, Adam must have been a gentleman. How could he have been a gentleman? You know, he was the first that ever bore arms. What, art a heathen? Dost thou under, how dost thou understand the scriptures? The scriptures say Adam digged. Could he dig without arms? <coughs> okay, terrible joke. I'll put another question to thee. More terrible jokes to come. If thou answerest me not to the purpose, confess thyself. Go to. What is he that builds stronger than either the mason, the shipwright, or the carpenter? The gallows maker, for that outlives a thousand um, tenants. I like thy wit well in good faith. The gallows does well, but how does it well? It does well to those that do ill. Now thou dost ill to say the gallows is built stronger than the church. Argle, the gallows may do well to thee. Show it again. Who built stronger than a mason, a shipwright, or a carpenter? Huh? Tell me that, and unyoke. Mary, now I can tell. To it. Mass, I cannot tell. Cudgel thy brains no more about it, for their dull ass will not mend his pace with beating. And when you are asked this question next, say, a grave maker. Oh, the houses he makes lasts till doomsday. 
and I'll get the inn and fetch me a sup of liquor. So this is um, another sort of a joke. Grave makers, it's a, it's a joke that has to do with their profession. And he says that houses you make, that he makes lasts till doomsday. And then he starts to dig a little bit more. And he's whistling while he works, so to speak. He's singing. And he's, and it says in the, um, in the text, it says, throws up um, sometimes it says throws up a skull. Now, of course, he doesn't throw up a skull. He throws up a shovel full of earth with the skull in it. And one of the things people want to know is why is it that all these skulls are coming out of the grave? Well, if you've gone to see a churchyard, see, nowadays we bury people in huge cemeteries with lots and lots of space. But in England or in other small countries, what you have is a churchyard that gets very full very quickly. So what do you do? Well, when you need to bury somebody, again, what you do is you wait about oh, eight, nine, ten years until the soft bits are all gone. And then you just dig up the skeleton, stack them in what's called a charnel house, and put a new tenant in. And that is what they're doing for Ophelia. They're going to put her body in the grave, and that means they need to clear out the previous occupants. And so all of these skulls are coming up. Hamlet comes in and says, gosh, has he no feeling of his business? He sings in grave making, and Horatio says, well, it's his job. He's used to it. Um, and then Hamlet starts to philosophize about the skulls. That skull had a tongue in it and could sing once. How the knave jowls it to the ground as to Cain's jawbone that did the first murder. And he starts to speculate. Maybe he was a politician. Maybe he was a lady. Maybe it was um, the skull of a lawyer, which, you know, just as in Jurassic Park, lawyers have never been popular. So that seems reasonable. At this point, though, the skull is just a theoretical skull. It's not a skull that belongs to anybody Hamlet knows. And that's about to change. For Hamlet, it's all abstract. To the gravedigger, skulls are pretty much everyday business. And Hamlet starts to ask him a bunch of questions about grave making. Whose grave is this, sir? Mine, sir. I think it be thine indeed, for thou liest in it. You lie out on it, sir, and therefore tis not yours. For my part, I do not lie in it, yet tis mine. What man dost thou dig it for? For no man, sir. For what woman, then? For none, neither. Who is to be buried in it? One that was a woman, sir, but rest her soul, she's dead. <laughs> More jokes. And then Hamlet starts to say, when was it that you, how long have you been doing this, in fact? And the, the um, grave digger says, I have been doing this as long when on the day that our last king, Hamlet, overcame Fortinbras. When was that? Well, that was the same day young Hamlet was born. So that's how we know that Hamlet's 30 years old. He's, he was born on the day that this grave digger took up his first um, job. And he also talks about the, um, Hamlet's having been off to England. You'll notice he doesn't recognize Hamlet. He's never personally seen him before. Um, but he's heard tell that he's crazy, and he's been sent to England. Well, why send him to England? Well, either he'll get better, or he says, no one will notice. Everybody in England is crazy anyway. And then Hamlet starts to ask about bodies. How long will a man lie in the earth ere he rot? Faith, if he be not rotten before he die, as we have many pocky corpses that will scarce hold the laying in, it will last you some eight year, nine year, a tanner will last you nine year. Tanners, because they've tanned their hide very effectively. And then he pulls up another skull. Here's a skull now, it's lying you in the earth three and twenty years. Whose was it? A horse and mad fellow's was it? Whose do you think it was? <laughs> I know not. A pestilence on him for a mad rogue. He poured a flag and a Rhenish on my head once. This same skull, sir, was your skull, the king's jester. This? Even that? Alas, poor Yorick. I knew him, Horatio. Now, most of the time when you hear this, it's done as, Alas, poor Yorick, I knew him, Horatio. But that's not it. It's, oh my gosh. This is a skull I know. This was my playmate. I remember him from when I was a child. It's scary. 
because death starts to take on a very personal look when you see it this way. Not now one to mock your own grinning, quite shopfallen. Now, get you to my lady's chamber and tell her, let her paint an inch thick to this favor must she come. Make her laugh at that. Ooh. Prithee, Horatio, tell me one thing. What's that, my lord? Dost thou think Alexander looked in the earth thus? Even so, and smelt so? Oh! That's another thing about the reality of death. You can philosophize about it all you want, but actually dead people look terrible and they smell bad, as the gravedigger is happy to tell you. We've moved from the abstract personification of death to the concrete death, and then it doesn't get more concrete than Ophelia's death. He's wondering when the cortege, the funeral cortege of Ophelia comes in with Laertes, um, why is it that this is not a proper funeral? It doesn't have all of the things that a normal funeral would have, and that's because they think Ophelia might have killed herself. In fact, she wouldn't have gotten a regular funeral in a churchyard at all if Claudius hadn't stepped in and forced it. Um, Laertes is very upset by this, and he thinks she should have a regular funeral. And then Gertrude steps forward and throws flowers into her grave. Sweets to the sweet, farewell. I hope thou shouldst have been my Hamlet's wife. I thought thy bride bed to have decked sweet maid and not have strewed thy grave. Think about that next time somebody gives you a piece of chocolate and says sweets to the sweet. Ugh. And then Laertes jumps into her grave. There's all of these theatrics. And he says, bury me alive in the grave. And Hamlet jumps out and says, you know, I'm just as sorry as you. What is he whose grief bears such an emphasis, whose phrase of sorrow conjures the wandering stars and makes them stand like wonder-wounded hearers? This is I, Hamlet the Dane, the devil take thy soul. Thou prayest not well. I prithee, take thy fingers from my throat. So what's happened is Laertes has, you know, the body's gone into the grave. Laertes has jumped into the grave. Hamlet has jumped into the grave. And now they're having a fist fight in Ophelia's grave. Not very dignified. And Hamlet insists, I loved Ophelia. Forty thousand brothers could not with all their quantity of love make up my sum. What wilt thou do for her? Would sigh? Would weep? Would fast? Would tear thyself? Would drink up Eisel? Eat a crocodile? I'll do it. So we're going to have the who loved her more competition. Kind of would have been nice if he would have told Ophelia that he loved her before she died, but that's the way things go. Um... He does feel bad, though, about going against Laertes in this way. And in a moment or two, we're going to see that he recognizes the parallel between himself and Laertes. Um, we're stuck with Hamlet having come back. This is a big disappointment to Claudius. And Hamlet, in the next scene, explains this to Horatio. Now, I should mention that in Act 4, there is a scene that was in Corto 1 that was omitted. Horatio gets a letter from Hamlet saying, we were attacked by pirates, um, I got taken by the pirates, and Rosencrantz and Guildenstern went on to England, and so that's why I'm here. And Horatio, in this omitted scene, goes to Gertrude and says, I heard from your son, um, I did all of, you know, and he's okay. And Gertrude says, oh, thank goodness, I can't stand the king anymore, I'm just humoring him. Now that's gone, and the question is, when that clarifies Gertrude's feeling so much, why did Shakespeare leave it out? Why is it there in that one text that we never perform, and why is it gone? And I'll leave that decision to you, but it's an interesting sidelight on Gertrude's character. Hamlet has to explain how it is that he wound up back in Denmark and what happened to RNG. And what happened was that Hamlet opened up the sealed orders from Claudius, which was in Rosencrantz and Guildenstern's bag, and it said, have Hamlet killed. Hamlet rewrote the order and resealed it up with his father's seal ring, which was, of course, the king's seal ring, saying, 
execute the bearers immediately and puts it back into Rosencrantz and Guildenstern's bag so that when Rosencrantz and Guildenstern get to England, they're going to be handing over their own death warrant, only they don't know it. Um, I mentioned that it's a bad idea to swim with the sharks, and that's exactly what happens to them. Horatio seems very distressed, so Guildenstern and Rosencrantz go to it. And Hamlet says, my man, they didn't make love to this uh, employment. They're not near my conscience. So Hamlet's become a politician, in some ways much less like Horatio than he once was. And he points out, look, this is a struggle between me and Claudius. And that's, you know, it's my death struggle in essence. Osric comes in, and he's ostentatiously taking his hat off in front of Hamlet. Um, he's Claudius's tool. Um, the only reason you would take your hat off like this would be in the presence of the king. So this is a kind of um, uh, an overly sugary type of flattery. That's why Hamlet keeps telling him, no, put your bonnet back on your head. And he wants to see how much he can get Osric to play up to him. Did the same sort of thing with Polonius. You know, well, gee whiz, yeah, it is kind of hot. On the other hand, it's kind of cold. Well, it's hot. Yes, it's hot and cold at the same time. I don't know how it's hot and cold at the same time, but you said so, so you must be right. So that's part of the thing. Um, Osric comes in to tell about Claudius's proposition. And the proposition is that he and Laertes will have this duel. It's not a real duel. It's only meant to be a fencing match. It's only meant to be um, an exhibition or sort of a, a, a sort of a competition, more like um, a gentlemanly boxing tournament. But instead, what of course is going to happen is that this is going to lead to Hamlet's death. Hamlet says he's not going to lose to Horatio. He's got no problem with it because he's been in continual practice ever since Her La Laertes went back to France. But he still has a bad feeling about this. If your mind dislike anything, obey it. I will forestall their repair hither and say you are not fit. Not a whit. We defy augury. There is special providence in the fall of a sparrow. If it be now, tis not to come. If it be not to come, it will be now. If it be not now, yet it will come. The readiness is all. Since no man of aught he leaves knows what's to leave betimes, let be. Hamlet has reached a sense of peace. Remember, he was trying to think, when am I going to get my revenge? What am I going to do? What's going to happen? And now he's saying... I leave my disposition up to God, in essence. This is really, I am just ready to have ha what is supposed to happen, happen. And so that, that, that statement of his, the readiness is all, is really everything. Now, Hamlet publicly apologizes to Laertes. He says, I really never intended to hurt you or your family. I'm really sorry. And Laertes is forced to shake his hand and pretend that everything is okay because, of course, he's going to murder him in a minute, but it's an accident. Um, Hamlet is making this almost like a joke. I'll be your foil, Laertes, making a reference to the, um, to the swords that they're using. Um, remember that they have that, that Laertes is going to use a sword which has no button on the end, which is what they call unbaited. It's a sharp sword, and he's going to actually kill Hamlet that way. And they're kind of looking at the swords in Osric's, um, uh, that Osric offers them, almost like you'd take golf clubs out of a caddy's uh, bag. And the proposition is supposed to be that um, it's three hits. It's uh, two hits out of three, normal fencing match. And that um, if Hamlet gives the first or second hit, he's supposed to get this cup, which has a pearl in it. Now, of course, it's not a pearl cup. It's a cup with poison in it. This is Claudius's idea. I mentioned this is overplanned. This is a mistake. So Hamlet does get the first hit, and Osric is there as the judge. And it seems to be going 
reasonably well. Um, in fact, Gertrude is very proud of her son, and she says, he'll win, he's really good. And then Hamlet doesn't drink. He says he's not ready. Instead, Gertrude reaches over and takes that poisoned cup. Gertrude, do not drink. I will, my lord. I pray you pardon me. It is the poisoned cup. It is too late. He is enough to say, well, don't drink it. But he can't, Claudius can't bring himself to say, don't drink it because it's poisoned or to knock it out of her hand. So the question is, how much does he really love his wife? He says that he loves her, but not so much that he would endanger himself by confessing that he was planning to poison Hamlet. Not going to do that. Um, Laertes actually seems to stab Hamlet when he's not looking. Haven't you now? And he wounds Hamlet. And then, it, the stage direction says, then in scuffling they change rapiers. And that's an extraordinary thing. They both have to somehow accidentally drop their swords and switch it around so that now Hamlet has got the pointy poisoned one, and then he get Nick's Laertes. Question. When is it correct to seek revenge? Hamlet has to wait until... He publicly accuses the king, or Laertes publicly accuses the king, and his own death is imminent, and the entire Danish court can see this. How is it, Laertes? Why, as a woodcock to mine own spring jaws, Rick, I am justly killed with mine own treachery. How does the queen? She swoons to see them bleed. No, no, the drink, the drink, oh, my dear Hamlet, the drink, the drink. I am poisoned. And so Gertrude goes out first. Oh, villainy. Oh, let the door be locked. Treachery. Seek it out. Something's wrong. And Laertes confesses. It is here, Hamlet. Hamlet, thou art slain. No medicine in the world can do thee good. In thee there is not half an hour's life. The treacherous instrument is in thy hand, unbated and envenomed. Lo, here I lie, never to rise again. Thy mother's poisoned, I can no more. The king, the king's to blame. Okay, here I am. I've got a murder instrument in my hand. I'm going to die. The guilt is established. Everyone can see. Now, the readiness is all. Now I'm ready. The point in Venom 2. Then, Venom, to thy work. And he kills Claudius. Now Claudius is, says that he's just hurt. He's almost like a cockroach. He takes a lot of killing, you know, stomp, 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 stomp. And so Hamlet says, you know, he takes the rest of the poison and pours it down Claudius' throat. Here, thou incestuous, murderous, damned dame, drink off this potion. Is thy union here? Follow my mother. And Laertes says, well, it's only just. He put the poison there himself and asks for Hamlet to forgive him. Hamlet, of course, forgives him because, as he said earlier, I can see his cause in my own. We are so similar. We have both lost our fathers in this terrible way. And then he says, I am dead, Horatio. You that look pale and tremble at this chance that are but mutes or audience to this act, had I but time, as this fell sergeant, death is strict in his arrest. Oh, I could tell you, but let it be. Horatio, I am dead. Thou livest. Report me and my cause are right to the unsatisfied. So Horatio's job is to live you must tell my story. I won't be able to do it. And Horatio agrees. In this harsh world, draw thy breath in pain to tell my story. And then we hear that Fortinbras is here, and so are the ambassadors from England. And he's not going to hear any of this stuff, but he, as his only kingly act, 
gives the throne over to Fortinbras. Fortinbras will now be the king of Denmark, thus ending his own revenge story um, of, of his father against Hamlet's. So tell him with the occurrence more and less which have solicited, the rest is silence. For Hamlet it is, but not for us, because Horatio says, I can tell you. Fortinbras walks in and says, what happened here? Good question. A lot of bodies on this stage. The ambassadors from England say, well, we did execute Rosencrantz and Guildenstern just like we were told to. Who are we supposed to give our report to? Who are we supposed to give our report to? Everybody's dead. And Horatio says, I will tell it. So shall you hear of carnal, bloody, and unnatural acts, of accidental judgments, casual slaughters, of deaths put on by cunning and forced cause, and in this upshot, purposes mistook, fallen on the inventor's heads. All this can I truly deliver. And Fortinbras says, put him on the stage with the bodies. Let him tell his story. What we have seen then is Horatio's story. It's Horatio's story of Hamlet. Horatio, as this play ends, is about to tell the very play that we have just seen. Hamlet then ends with Fortinbras taking the throne. Whether what's rotten in Denmark has been fully expunged is, is uh, up to you to decide. But there certainly seems to be a sense in which Hamlet has fulfilled his mission. He has set the time that was out of joint right. And so even though everyone's dead, this can be a very satisfying play. Uh, very, it, the, there's not a lot more closure that can happen. There's just as many, about as many dead bodies as there were major characters. Now, I'd like you to make sure to keep up with your assignments, which I know you've had a lot of lectures, but the Hamlet lectures are really critical. Keep checking your syllabus and the dates for which things are due. There should be a class meeting soon, and I'll be explaining at that class meeting how to use the software scenario to stage your scene from Hamlet. You should have already turned in your first paper. Do it right now if you haven't. The next one is due in week nine. There's also a discussion question this week. Answer it in the usual way. Uh, we have web links. We have a lot of really nice multimedia links for Hamlet. And I'd like you to begin reading the first three acts for, of Othello for next week. We're going to be doing another tragedy, but with a very different flavor. And until then, I'll be saying goodbye. Get reading your Shakespeare. <laughs>